Imagine for a moment that we're in the future. Computing techniques and artificial intelligence have become so sophisticated that they allow us to simulate human life by computer. They can simulate an entire planet like ours, including outer space, and its billions of inhabitants with their memories, personalities, and even the smallest bodily details. These simulated humans would be self-aware and could believe their existence is real, unaware they are the product of an advanced programmer's ingenuity. At this point, a disturbing question arises. What if this has already happened? What if we are the simulated humans? A famous argument circulating online suggests that being inside a simulation is the most likely scenario. Is it possible we're already inside a video game? Or do philosophers have more to say? Let's analyze it. What's this about living in a simulation? How can such a thing be proven? Starting from these concerns about being sims, philosopher Nick Bostrom presented his famous simulation argument. One of the main lines of reasoning in general terms is this. If the human species doesn't go extinct first, we'll achieve nearly divine technology. Technology that will allow us to create perfect simulations of ourselves. Just as many people now use their computers to create videos, music, and video games, as post-humans will use this new technology to recreate our ancestors from any era over and over. Even with variations, a world where everyone can fly, another where the predominant aesthetic is that of the Matrix, or a version where Google, Microsoft, and Apple merge to control the world as a supranational entity. Here comes the crucial part. Bostrom argues that if we don't go extinct before having and using this technology, it's almost certain that you and I are living in a simulation. In other words, what's more likely? That we're humans patiently waiting to reach the post-human state? Or that we're already inside one of the numerous simulations created by previous civilizations? The odds are against us. There's an even more mind-bending variation. What if these simulations could in turn create other simulations? What if in the virtual world of leather and latex, these post-humans developed their own virtual worlds? More virtual worlds could exist within these simulations. A cascade of simulations containing other simulations. And we return to the same question. What's more likely? That we're in the original reality or in the infinity of worlds that unfolds. It's frightening. But let's put some order to all this. The idea of living in a fictional reality isn't new. Ancient philosophers wondered if everything we experience is a dream or a scheme managed by some evil genius. However, the popular success of Bostrom's argument lies in its reliance on future technology, which promises so much. Influential figures like Elon Musk claim there's only one chance in billions that we're living in base reality. Some Silicon Valley magnates are even trying to figure out how we could escape the matrix. But wait, let's not fall into the trap. The idea has serious flaws in its foundation. Bostrom assumes, first, that we're not the first intelligent species to exist. Second, that we won't go extinct before this supposed post-human stage. And third, that we'll achieve the technical capability to simulate all the reality we observe. Look at the third assumption. Is it absolutely certain we'll ever be able to create such a simulation? For us, technological progress seems almost natural. Processors keep getting smaller, machines more efficient, and things that were once magic are now routine. We dreamed of flying, and indeed now we fly. And we think this will continue, that our dream of perfectly simulating reality will come true. But this is an assumption. It's something you have to believe. The history of technology has taken many unexpected turns, and there's no guarantee all our dreams will come true. Yes, we fly. But we fly inside a metal frame, not like Superman. There might even be insurmountable problems. Physics tells us certain limits are impossible to overcome, like moving faster than the speed of light. It's not a matter of technological advancement. The universe simply works that way. Perhaps coding human consciousness is among the things that can never be done, regardless of the computing power we achieve. Speaking of consciousness, we still don't fully understand what it is or how it originates, but some authors maintain we'll never be able to put it into a computer program. Using Turing's expression, it might not be computable. There are mathematical problems that humans solve well, but no computer can resolve. Bostrom's post-human stage would make it possible for sentient and self-aware beings to emerge from data stored in a computer system. This is the goal of so-called strong artificial intelligence, building devices that reproduce our way of thinking and feeling. It's based on an idea, 
Minds and computers are comparable. The brain would be the hardware and the mind the software. That's too big a leap. To understand this, let's discuss John Searle's Chinese room argument. The idea is this. Imagine a closed room with a pair of windows and a person who only understands English, tasked with receiving questions in Chinese through one window and answering in Chinese through the other. The catch is they don't know any Chinese. They just follow the rules in a manual that tells them what to write in each case. Anyone outside the room would say the person knows Chinese, but it's not true. They're only handling symbols, the syntactic level, without engaging with their meanings, the semantic level. In other words, although they're doing it right, they have no idea what they're doing. This differs little from what happens inside a machine designed for a specific task. Perhaps these computer-designed humans could defend their favorite Simpsons episode, but they wouldn't really be reflecting on narrative. They'd give an answer simulating having had that thought and would appear conscious from the outside. But emulating a mind isn't the same as having one. Thinking is much more than executing algorithms, and being human isn't reducible to a code of instructions. It involves understanding what you're doing, feeling it, and being conscious of it. Additionally, this debate often leaves behind the physical support, our body. We don't fully understand how evolution made it possible for a primate with a gelatinous mass in its head to be conscious of thinking and being an individual distinct from others, with their own memories, ideas, and feelings. But perhaps the biological substrate of our brains is essential for consciousness. If that's the case, even if we don't go extinct, we'll never be able to simulate other people computationally to the point where they truly feel and think. And there's more. Suppose we accept, for a moment, that we're simulated humans. Would the programmers allow us to suspect we're mere software? Would they let us create our own simulations? In fact, Bostrom's argument would have to apply to our simulators. How would they know they're not also a simulation? Moreover, if we were simulated, Bostrom himself would be in quite a predicament. He would have written his article from a false world. The physical laws allowing him to extrapolate about simulation technology might not be the laws governing the base world, the truly real one. How can we take the argument seriously without knowing if our ideas refer to reality? Another weak point of the argument is assuming that simulating us would be interesting for these highly advanced super-intelligent beings. But possessing technology doesn't necessarily mean using it. Perhaps precisely because they're so advanced, their ethics would prevent them from playing with characters who feel and suffer. If posthumans were benevolent, why would they simulate the world we live in with suffering, pain, and evil? Why reproduce the Holocaust and humanity's great miseries which they would surely be ashamed of? If we're already placing ethical limits on artificial intelligence, why wouldn't they? This refutation has many parallels with the idea of a creator god. In this case, a post-human creator with the ability to pull the plug. Similar to arguments for God's existence, we can never satisfactorily prove we're not in a simulation. Any evidence or rebuttal we present could be simulated. A trap set by the gods to make us confident. Fortunately, we have rational tools to, at minimum, seriously doubt all this. Occam's razor comes to our rescue, telling us it's inappropriate to postulate entities unnecessarily. Basically, if we have two theories trying to explain our world and make predictions, which do we choose? The one that tells us about a universe with its laws and structures, or the one that tells us there's another universe simulating our universe? Since we're clear that in both cases there's a real universe, why add a meta-universe to the equation? It doesn't explain or solve anything that the old deities didn't aspire to solve. Nevertheless, if you're worried about living in a simulation, consider that you're still part of reality. There's only one reality, which includes the real universe and all simulated ones. Would our lives change much if we were simulated but never knew it? The experience would be the same. Joy, pleasure, pain, thirst, and hunger would still drive us to act. Are you afraid someone might get bored with us and turn off the computer? To be honest, physicists suspect several cosmic threats that would also mean the end. However, taking the simulation thesis seriously has one danger. Ignoring our responsibilities as individuals and as a society. I'm sorry, but although the idea might be interesting for a debate among friends and fertile ground for philosophical discussion, assuming simulation forces us to accept too many assumptions. Things we don't know if they are or will be true. Just because we can think of something doesn't make it possible or real. So, however tempting it might be to say this reality is a simulation, to convince yourself you're real, it's most reasonable to think we don't live in the matrix. 
This is just an analysis to share our passion for knowledge and critical thinking. In the end, what's important is to always maintain an open but critical mind toward these fascinating possibilities.